Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Revolution Health Radio. This is Chris Kresser. I'm really excited about this show. We're going to be speaking with Dr. Rangan Chatterjee, who is the star of the hit BBC One series, Doctor in the House, which as far as I know is the only primetime television series devoted to essentially to functional medicine uh, and the approach that we talk about so much on this show. He's also the author of The the Four Pillar Plan, a book released in the UK, which will be um, coming out today, actually, in the US as How to Make Disease Disappear. And I met Rangan in the UK uh, when I was there last year doing some teaching, and we hit it off right away because not only do we share the same passion for reversing chronic disease, we have a pretty similar a proposal for how to do it. And so that's what we're going to be talking about in today's show. And I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Let's dive in. Hey everyone, Chris Kresser here with a brief message before we begin the podcast. Imagine a career that draws on your passion for wellness and disease prevention, that harnesses your ability to support and connect with others, that helps you to develop as a person while you help others to do the same. What if you could earn a living while making an impact on thousands of people's lives and even on the future of healthcare? That'd be pretty great, right? Well, that job does exist. It's the job of a health coach. And I believe that health coaches will play a crucial role in the future of medicine, not only in the US, but around the world. One in two Americans now has a chronic disease and one in four have multiple chronic diseases. Chronic disease is destroying our quality of life, shortening our lifespan, bankrupting governments, and threatening the health of future generations. And our medical model is not prepared to address it. Why? Because the only way to prevent or reverse chronic disease is by changing our diet, lifestyle, and behavior. And conventional medicine is simply not set up to do this. Bottom line, we need people who can provide this support to help people make the changes they need to make to save their lives. We need empathetic and compassionate people with a skill for connecting and a passion for change. And my job is to make sure they have all the training they need to do their job so well, they will change the future of healthcare. A career as a health coach can be incredibly fulfilling, both professionally and personally. It really could change your life and it can also change the world. That's why I'm excited to announce that we're launching the ADAPT Health Coach Training Program in early June of this year. It's a 12-month, 100% online certification that will prepare you for a successful career as a health coach. It includes training in core coaching skills, functional health, ancestral diet and lifestyle, and professional development. And it's unlike any other health coach training program currently available. Enrollment opens in April and space is limited. We sold out the first cohort of the ADAPT Practitioner Training Program when it launched, and we expect to do the same for this health coach training program. To be notified when enrollment opens and to learn more about the program, visit cresser.co slash success. That's K-R-E-S-S-E-R dot C-O slash success. When you sign up for updates, you'll also get access to our free Health Coach Success Series, which covers a variety of topics related to building a successful career as a health coach, including why health coaches will play a vital role in the future of medicine, what a health coach is and isn't, and how they differ from nutritionists and dietitians, the crucial skills and competencies a health coach needs to succeed, and how to attract and retain clients and manage your practice. Sign up at cresser.co slash success. Now on to the show. Rangan Chatterjee, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. I'm really looking forward to this. Chris, it's the, the pleasure is mine. Thank you very much for inviting me. So we met um, when I came over to the UK last year. I think that was. It's all such a blur. <laughs> um, you to London, didn't you, to speak? And- yeah. <laughs> went out for a lovely dinner actually yeah i really enjoyed that mark hyman introduced us uh via email before we came over and said hey you two guys should know each other and and he was definitely right we hit it off immediately in large part because we share not only a, a passion for 
reinventing healthcare and, and the future of medicine, but also a pretty similar perspective on how we should go about doing that. Yeah, and absolutely. That's what I'd love to dive into today. And I want to start by talking, you know, maybe a little bit about just your background, you know, how you came to functional medicine and this perspective that, you, that we share on, on reinventing healthcare and medicine. And then I want to talk a little bit about your experience with the TV show, because here in the U.S., you know, we don't have access to it. And so while uh, that's a pretty well-known show and people have had a lot of exposure to it in the U.K., some of my U.S. listeners might not be as familiar with what's going on. I think it's a really interesting portal to like, how functional medicine can get a wider adoption and exposure. Yeah, well, Chris, first of all, I mean, just a bit of background in terms of you know, my journey and how I've got to where I am today, certainly in terms of my perspective. You know, I've been seeing patients now as a medical doctor for almost, you know, it's pretty much 17 years, actually. And, you know, my career has gone through various evolutions during that time because the reality is, you know, you leave medical school and you think that you have been given all the tools that you need to get your patients better. Because that's ultimately why you end up at medical school is to, you know, you think you can learn how, how to do that, right? Yeah. And it sounds so obvious. But when I reflect back on my career, I think there was a, a discontentment in the way that I had been taught to practice medicine that was probably there right from the start, although I don't think I quite realized it because I mm-hmm. started off in the acute medical setting. So I was training... Um, in hospitals, dealing with a lot of emergencies. You know, I was, I remember running the cardiac arrest team for the hospital for a period of time and, you know, doing all the things that you think, you know, modern medicine is, you know, with the defib and all that kind of crazy stuff, which you see on television. And as a young guy in their twenties, you know, think, you know, this is medicine, right? Right. Um, and I went through my training. I was going to be a specialist. So I, I got my exams, what, Certainly in the UK, we call it the MRCP, Member of the Royal College of Physicians. A uh, very tough set of exams to, you know, certify in internal medicine. And I was, you know, planning to do nephrology or kidney medicine. And I just started to get a little bit, I don't know, a little bit frustrated, you know, month on month, sort of year on year, I was getting a little bit frustrated to sort of think that I'm... I don't really want to spend the rest of my career just seeing kidneys and <laughs> and kidney problems. Yeah. And I thought I'm going to, you know, I'm going to move to general practice. Now, to put this in perspective, you know, I come from a medical family, and my dad, you know, my dad was a was a consultant in uh, genito urinary medicine. I think he was a bit flabbergasted that his son, uh, you know, was going to leave the hallowed turf of being a specialist mm. to move to becoming a generalist. Right. Um, but I, I really had this, uh, this calling it from inside me saying, look, I, I want to see everything. I want to see how everything interacts with everything else. And so I, I moved to general practice. I did my exams at that and I started working. And, you know, I loved it. But a few years in, I, I honestly sat back at the end of the day and I thought, how many people have I really helped today? Mm-hmm. And I came up with a figure of 20%. I thought... Mm-hmm. You know, 80% of the people that had come in, I wasn't convinced that I'd actually done that much for them. You know, sure, I'd, I may have given them a prescription, a pill to suppress their symptoms, but I, I really didn't feel that I'd, I, I'd actually helped them understand what was going on. I don't think I knew what was going on in terms of what was driving their illness. So I think I, the, the difficulty is, Chris, and I'm sure you've heard this before from people, is that it's very hard to know what to do with that. You know, you've right. all your training, your whole career, everything is shaped around the, the, the system, the way it currently is. And then for me, you know, as many people have a, you know, have a, an experience with illness, either themselves or with a family member that, that you know, really changes everything. And, and for me, it was when my son, who is now seven years old, but he was six months old, uh, at the time, and he, my wife and I, we went on holiday for, you know, it was just gone Christmas, it was around, I think, the 27th of December, I can remember it so clearly, we went to Chamonix in France uh, for a holiday, and my son stopped moving, his arms went back, he had a convulsion, uh, and, you know, really, I panicked, because I thought that, you know, 
uh, I thought he might be choking. My wife had called out to me and I knew that he had a lot of mucus and phlegm throughout the day. I tried to turn him over and slap him on the back and clear his airway and nothing was happening. And, you know, the truth is in that moment, I wasn't a, you know, highly qualified medical doctor. I was a worried father. Absolutely. It must've been terrifying. You know, even now I, I, I think back to it and it, it was horrible. It really was horrible. And, uh, my wife said, come on, we've got to go now. We've got to get to the hospital. And, um, we rushed into the car. I nearly killed us all. It just snowed there. And, you know, we were on a steep, a steep road down to the main roads and the car skidded, but ultimately we got to the hospital and, you know, many of you listeners might be familiar that a six month old having a convulsion is not that uncommon. If there is a fever there, it's what we call here a febrile convulsion, but he didn't have a fever you know, his temperature was absolutely normal. And you could see the admitting doctors and nurses were incredibly worried because that, well, why is this, why is this boy not moving? Why is he having a convulsion without a fever? Yeah. And, you know, we were in a small hospital. He had to be blue lighted and ambulance down to the main hospital down the valley because we were in the mountains. And, you know, a few hours later, some of the preliminary blood started coming back. Now in this time frame he already had two lumbar punctures you know and we're a health conscious family my wife had breastfed for six months this was the sort of public health guidance we you know we're pretty you know we're pretty switched on we thought with respect to our health and then the blood results come back and the doctor said his you know he's had a seizure because his calcium levels were too low in his body uh, so he had a hypocalcemic convulsion and to put it in perspective, you know, the normal range for serum calcium in that hospital is the same as in the UK, which is 2.2 to 2.6. His calcium level was 0.97. So, you know, frankly, barely compatible with actually, you know, life in, in, in many ways. And, you know, so we, everyone's scratching their head, why has he got such a low calcium level? You know, what's been going on there? And then again, we had to wait, and a bit later on, because in this in this time frame, initially we thought he might have had meningitis, or you know the doctors were very worried. So we were in, you know, we were panicked in a foreign hospital trying to figure out what the hell was going on. And then it turns out that his vitamin D level was almost non-existent. Hmm. So to cut a long story short, ultimately a fully preventable vitamin deficiency, uh, vitamin D, caused him to have a low calcium level in his blood, which caused him to have a convulsion. And that was incredibly challenging to get my head around. I mean, of course, I was delighted that we found out what the problem was and that, you know, just to reiterate, modern medicine saved his life. You know, he had an intravenous right. calcium infusion, right? Great, superb. Well, you bring the calcium level back up into the normal range, you know, that was fantastic, but nobody there taught me or told me, you know, what are the consequences of the fact that your son may have been deficient or certainly suboptimal levels of vitamin D potentially for the last six months, arguably in utero as well? What, you know, what are the consequences of that? And how can you go about potentially repairing some of those? You know, my son had pretty bad eczema at the time. And, you know, obviously we know now and, and you know, <laughs> I'm sure many doctors knew back then that it's pretty clear that vitamin D is a critical nutrient for the immune system. Eczema is in some way a dysfunction of the immune system. Could the two be linked? Of course they could be. Yeah. And, and for me, Chris, really what happened in that moment was, yes, I'd been frustrated, but in that moment it was like, I, by conventional measures, am a highly qualified, double board certified medical doctor Yet my son nearly died from a preventable vitamin deficiency. And something, it was like a switch changed in me. I was, yeah. in that moment, I was like, I'm going to find out why this happened, how this happened, and I'm going to get my son back to full optimal health, or I'm going to try to, as if none of this had ever happened. That was the challenge that I set to myself. And, you know, in the age of the internet, Chris, you know, you can spend three, four hours a day researching. And that's exactly what I did, you know, week after week, month after month, year after year. The more I learned, the more I put into practice with him, the more I put into practice with my family and myself, I could see the, the, the immense benefits for my son, 
I felt the benefits myself, started applying the same principles with my patients. I was like, well, this is, this is the sort of medicine I wish I'd learned in medical school. You know, I'm understanding root causes of ill health. I'm, you know, I'm figuring out how you can help people not only improve their symptoms, but, you know, certainly in many cases reverse their, their realness. And it's just transformed my career, Chris. It's transformed the way I look at health. It has in many ways shaped what I have done in the media for the past four or five years. And I often reflect back and think, you know, had this not happened to my son, would I be doing what I'm doing? Mm-hmm. I don't know. You know, I can't yeah. answer that. I, potentially, I would have, maybe I would have found, maybe the frustration would have got the better off me uh, in another way. But this really forced my hand. And I'm pleased to say that my son is a thriving, healthy, eczema free uh, seven year old boy who, you know, I think is doing incredibly well and arguably healthier than many kids around him who maybe have not had this problem. So, you know, slightly long winded story, Chris, for that in a nutshell is why I do what I do. No, that's, it's so great. I mean, it got, it got very real and very personal for you in a way that it, it did for me in a you know, slightly different way. But that's what really, I think at the end of the day, almost everybody who's doing this work, you know, that we, that we talk about, you know, Mark Hyman and, you know, many of the thought leaders and influencers have a similar story because when it affects you personally or a family member personally, there's just no other motivation that's quite as urgent. Absolutely. But Chris, we need to, we've spoken about this before. At the moment, I find that the people who are trying to adopt this approach to chronic disease, you know, the thought leaders, but all the thousands of practitioners around the world who are also trying to do this, pretty much all of them that I've met have got a personal story. And I get that because I'm one of those but we need to move beyond that. We need to move like what you're doing with the Crestor Institute. We need this education to be there for all healthcare professionals, basically, not just those who've had a personal. Absolutely. Person. Yeah. And your story with your son is really, I think, revealing because it points to this, you know, this principle of we're not looking or W, that's my version of WNL, you know, in, in medicine, we think of WNL as within normal limits. You know, uh, if you do a lab test, then it's within the normal limits. But I have another way of looking at WNL, which is we're not looking. And your story with your son, like the vitamin D thing was easy to detect and easy to correct, but it wasn't part of the standard thought process of what you should be looking for you know, early on in his life. And then I had a patient last week um, in her late seventies who came in and, you know, she had some of the typical complaints you might expect of someone of that age. She was, had a kind of a mild tremor. She was having some cognitive decline uh, and brain fog, difficulty concentrating. And, you know, her GPs had just written it off as, you know, you're getting older, you're in your late seventies. What do you expect? This is standard. And yet when we tested, did a full comprehensive blood panel on her, we found out that she had very severe B12 and folate deficiency and, you know, very high homocysteine. And, you know, she she had, again, a very easily correctable, at least if it was, had been detected, you know, in, in time, nutrient deficiency that was misdiagnosed as, you know, dementia and, you know, mild Parkinson's. So these are things that we, there's really no excuse for missing and not correcting. And yet we're not looking. Yeah, absolutely, Chris. And I'm sure you've got countless more stories like that from, from seeing patients as I have. You know, one thing to add there with, with my son's story is I'm sure many people listening might be thinking, well, yeah, so obvious. Why, you know, why wasn't he just giving his son vitamin D from birth? I think it's a reasonable question because the guidelines in this country actually do state that you should be doing that. The problem is nobody knows those guidelines. Yeah. And they're not being yeah. followed. And as I say, with all my qualifications, I didn't know them. Uh, but I tell you this, and this, I have replayed this over in my head so many times. Three weeks before we got on that plane, so it's the start of December, right? So my son's maybe five, five and a half months old. Mm-hmm. I had been coming across a bit more research on vitamin D. And we had a protocol in our surgery in a, in, a, in a different sort of part of the UK where, you know, I was starting to prescribe quite a lot of vitamin D to certain patients. 
Mm. And I started to think, I wonder if my son should be on this. Now, it's drilled into us in the UK by the GMC, the General Medical Council, that we should not be making those kind of decisions on our own family. In fact, it is very much frowned upon here right. to, to do anything treatment-wise for your own family. So I did what I thought I should do back then. And so I printed off the protocol and I phoned my wife up and I sent it to her. I said, hey, babe, can you just go make an appointment to the GP? Just go and ask him what he thinks about this. You know, I think that our son should probably be on vitamin D. Right. And so she prints it off. Uh, she goes to see a doctor and the doctor knows that I'm also a fellow healthcare professional. Mm-hmm. And he laughed at her and he said, look, you, this is just complete rubbish. You have just, uh, you could have just printed this off yourself and typed it up on Word and given it to me. Look, you're breastfeeding, you're doing a great thing. There's nothing more that you need to give your son. Yeah. Um, and she was a bit upset with the way it went down because I don't think he was that compassionate. And uh, mm-hmm. I thought when she reported this back to me, I thought, okay, fine. All right, let me do a bit more research. Let me look into this. You know, I'll figure it out not realizing the urgency of the situation. So I often think back, you know, could I, should I have just put my foot down then? And, you know, that's not a nice emotion as a dad uh, when you look back at these things. Having said that, Chris, you know, he could well have been deficient for months prior to that. This could have been... Absolutely, yeah. And and arguably, had I started supplementing then, uh, supplementing him just before this happened with a very low dose, let's say 400 international units of vitamin D or something Mm -hmm. like that, or 800 arguably it may not have changed anything or it may not have, you know, it could have gone undetected for a lot longer, at least this way. And again, I wish this had never happened, certainly for my son's sake, but by having it happen with that sort of magnitude, you know, I was forced to confront some very difficult questions and uncomfortable realities. And I was forced to go, uh, or I felt compelled to go and fix them. So you know, I do kind of believe that things happen for a reason. Maybe as humans, we have to believe that in order to get through. But I had a lot of guilt for a number of years. A guilt that actually drove me to learn more and help as many people as possible. But I know you're a father as well, Chris. I'm learning now to let go of that guilt. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, we can always second guess ourselves. And there's, I mean, there's so many situations like that that I can think of uh, myself with, with my daughter, things I wish I would have done differently. But I, I think this is more what you were saying before. It's about getting these, this knowledge and these guidelines and this understanding out on a wider scale. Because, you know, it, it is true. We can't, uh, you know, there's a saying, the doctor who treats himself has a fool for a patient. <laughs> you know, you could possibly extend that to family members because sometimes we're too close to really be able to tell. But, you know, what if there had been guidelines that not only should, you know, babies be tested, but pregnant women? should be tested for their vitamin D levels because guess where kids are, are supposed to get it, you know, from breast milk. And if a woman is deficient in pregnancy, then her breast milk is not going to be a sufficient source of it. And, you know, I always test my, my pregnant women patients for that now, but, you know, that's not something that's really widespread now, at least in this country. Well, I don't know how it is in the UK. One of the biggest frustrations for me about the way uh, medicine currently operates, or I should say uh, conventional or allopathic medicine, or whatever you want to call it, is it's very much been a black or white situation. You've either got an abnormal result or it's normal. Right. Um, there's, there's been no recognition, well, very little recognition of optimal. And there is this huge gray area in between, you know, overtly abnormal and, you know, disease and deficiency versus what is an optimal level for this human being to be functioning uh, as well as they can. A little bit like, you know, Dale Bredesen, the professor who's sort of showing how in some cases you can uh, reverse cognitive decline, certainly in, you know, early cases of Alzheimer's, he's managed to demonstrate that. But I love his approach, which is, you know, you've got to treat that person like a Formula One car. You know, you've got to optimize every single parameter that you can. Mm -hmm. And, I love that because that really isn't how we do things here, certainly in the UK. And I I know it's it's the same in the US. Even if you talk about blood sugar, you talk about a common condition like type 2 diabetes, there are still, you know, we've got slightly different ranges from you guys. So an HbA1c, the average blood sugar marker of 6.5 and above in this country is, I think, the same as you, is, you know, is a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. But our pre-diabetic range starts at 6 
So six to six point four is what we call pre-diabetic, whereas I know you guys, I think it's at five point seven. It's a little lower, yeah. It's a little lower, and you know these are just arbitrary figures that we could, you know, argue about all day. But yeah. What I'm trying to make is, in one of the practices I I worked at recently, patients who come in and get their blood sugar checked, if it comes back at five point nine, right? I know doctors who are still reporting that as normal. So what's happening is that patient phones at reception to say, hey, you know, well, my blood's okay. And the receptionist will report back saying, yeah, doctor said absolutely normal, nothing to worry about. So that patient then who's come, maybe they've come in for a medical or for a checkup just to see where is their health standing? Well, you know, what does their health look like at the moment? In that opportunity, we are reporting an HbA1c of 5.9 as normal, which is it's frank, you know, it's, it's madness. You know, I, I just don't understand how we've got so far off track in medicine where we can call that a normal blood sugar. Right. Um, just because it hasn't reached the arbitrary, it's something as if something magical happens when it goes one tenth of a point higher, then all of a sudden you have diabetes, whereas it was perfectly normal before that. Yeah. And even if all we did in conventional medicine, even if we did not adopt a full kind of functional lifestyle medicine approach. If, if, if we simply recognize that there's an optimal range and then there's a deficiency range and we should be striving to get our patients in those optimal ranges, you know, like, it, as I say, with blood sugar, for example, we could start maybe once the HbA1c is, I don't know, 5.2, let's say, or 5.3, start to you know, get people back in and say, hey, look, you know, you're, you're not pre-diabetic yet. You don't have type 2 diabetes yet. But actually, it's not your blood sugar is not as good as it could be. You know, can I show you some things that we can do to help optimize that? You know, so many people would actually, so many members of the public would welcome that. I go, really? I didn't realize that. Yeah, tell me what I can do. Right. Rather than waiting till it's crossed that, you know, 6.5, 6.6 type 2 diabetes threshold. When, yeah, sure, you can still turn it around sometimes, but it's clearly suboptimal to be getting involved there. Absolutely. So speaking of this, you know, we're talking about raising awareness of, of functional medicine and preventative medicine and what you call progressive medicine. And I think arguably you, you've had a bigger impact in terms of raising the public awareness of these concepts and just about anybody else because you've been doing a, a mainstream TV show about functional medicine in the UK for the last several years. I mean, we don't have anything like that still here in the US. And uh, I've really enjoyed following that and, and hearing more about the impact. And I think uh, our listeners here would, would love to hear a little bit more about, you know, your experience with that show, how it got started, and then, you know, what kind of impact you feel like that's had. Yeah, Chris, well, th thanks for asking me. That really has been, I'm incredibly fortunate and lucky to have had the experience that I've had. Uh, and I'll explain to you why I say that. I think the first thing to say is that I never got approached to do that show because of my approach to medicine. I think it was just quite fortuitous how it all happens. You know, I, I was on my journey of learning, right? I was going out to America at regular intervals. I was going to all the Institute of Functional Medicine conferences and I was, you know, literally, you know, just sucking up knowledge. You know, I had, I just, could, well, I'd, one conference had finished. I couldn't wait to book onto the next one and, you know, yeah. buy my flights and come straight back to learn more. As it's a story with many people who once they, you know, once their head gets switched onto this way of thinking. But but what happened while I was doing all this training, I was still in my sort of conventional practice, and the practice manager sent out a group email to all the MDs in the practice saying the BBC are looking for a new doctor. They've got a new concept uh, called Doctor in the House, which is what happens when you have more than 10 minutes with your patients. And you know, I <sighs> I remember seeing that email and thinking, what if you have more than 10 minutes? God, you can do so much. God, I'd love, you know, I, I had no ambition, Chris, to be a TV doctor. I, I, in fact, I can't stand that term, you know. It's like you're, you're no longer a doctor, you're a TV doctor. Um, right. I prefer a doctor who also appears on TV. Yes. Uh, but, but that's a minor point. And I, I phoned up the number, I said, you know, what's this about? Anyway, I ended up having like a 40 minute interview with the studio. And that turned into three months of basically interviews and tests and they'd film you with families and they'd take you around empty houses and say, what kind of things would you be looking for, you know, to try and, you know, what sort of clues would you be picking up? And, you know, what's interesting for me is I didn't prepare for a single one of those 
interviews. There were about eight of them over three months because I, I wasn't really desperate to be on television. I just thought, if these guys like me for who I am, great. If they don't, fine, you know, get someone else who might want to say what the, the right things to say in order to get on television. So I just went and did my thing. And three months later, you know, I heard they went through about 1,500 doctors. You know, somehow I get picked to make the series. Well, just to make one show, actually, but the show went so well that they made a decision for me to do a whole series. And, and that was a big decision for me because I thought, wow, this is a lot of exposure. BBC One is our is our main channel that gets the biggest viewing, and this is a prime time show. And I thought, wow, this, you know, this is a lot of exposure. But then I thought, what an opportunity here to see, you know, can I get various conditions, various families who've been struggling with their health for years, who've already been under GPs, specialists, other healthcare professionals, and they still can't get better. Can I get these guys better on television? And, you know, I didn't know what it would entail at the time. You know, like all these things, you just, you, you jump in the deep end and you kind of sink or swim. Right. Uh, and if I'm honest, Chris, to, to actually go into families' houses and spend all this time with them, you know, you get to, for example, if we talk about nutrition, right? This is not what people tell you they eat in your surgery, in your practice. You're actually watching what they really do eat, what they've got on their fridge, what have they got in their cupboards. You know, when they're snacking, what are they snacking on? Because, you know, everyone filters in front of their, uh, in front of their healthcare professional. You know, people tend to have a little filter on in terms of, you know, what do you eat on a typical day? Well, you, you know, are they going to tell you, Chris, what they eat on their best day when they're right. following you know, the principles in your book? Or yeah. are they going to do it, you know, when it's the Christmas holidays and they're actually, you know, feeling emotionally vulnerable and that's what they're eating then. So, mm -hmm. you know, or, or I got to see, you know, the few hours before bed, what are the family dynamics like? What are those interactions? The sort of things that actually would never probably come up in my surgery. And not only would they not come up, even if I asked about them, I suspect that they just wouldn't come up in the same way. So I was just seeing all kinds of things that I thought, wow, these are all playing a role in that person's health. And now that I can see that, I can actually, you know, potentially influence those things in, in a different way. And, you know, what's interesting for me, Chris, is that, you know, a typical functional medicine doctor will probably have a lot longer than, you know, you stand at 10 or 15 minutes, you know, you may have an hour or 45 minutes or an hour and a half with a patient. Right. And we all want more time. I potentially got too much time because here's, the, here's the, the other problem I had, Chris, is that when you know absolutely everything and you see it all, it's almost too much information because yeah. you can then literally, get, you, you don't have the security of your, of your surgery and your consultation room walls. You know, you, you're seeing people in their own setting. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you feel quite exposed actually. So... It, it was an incredible experience that the results I managed to demonstrate for those families, but also in front of uh, 5 million UK viewers a week, they're probably the proudest results of my career because I had some of my most difficult cases on that show. And, you know, as, as my best friend, who's not a doctor, tells me, it's like, you know, you've got 5 million people watching you do your job. I'm like, yeah, you told me this a few weeks before it came out. And I thought, I was pretty nervous anyway, but now yeah. I... <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, we can dive into a bit of the detail, but essentially I got to see a different side to people that from, that from what I see in my consultation room. And that has changed me, not only what I did on the series, but I'm a different doctor now than before I filmed the TV show. Mm -hmm. So folks who are listening, uh, although you can't, yet watch the full series. I think there are quite a few YouTube clips of the show. Yes, there are actually, I found that there was, there's quite a few on YouTube and I've just, I put them all together on my YouTube channel so people can watch at least eight of those episodes free of charge on the internet. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I really recommend doing that. It's, it's really great to see these concepts, you know, on primetime television going out to people who are totally unfamiliar with them. So, I, you know, I'm just curious. There's so many things we could talk about related to that show, but I'm mostly curious, like in this context, what was the feedback that you received from professional colleagues 
and also just from the general public in terms of being exposed to these concepts? What, what kind of impact do you think it's had in the UK and how has it changed the conversation? Yeah, Chris, look, I think it's had a huge impact. I mean, I get invited to by the NHS to come and talk about how we implement the strategies, the things that they saw on television. How do we get that into the National Health Service and make that widespread? You know, clearly having a doctor in your house for four to six weeks is not a it's not a rational or actionable kind of national strategy to reverse <laughs> the, the, chronic health, the chronic disease trajectory. But what can we learn from that? You know, I just, human emotion is we focus on the negatives, right? You know, if I get, you know, 99 really collaborative and uh, inspirational bits of feedback, and then, you know, one of those, you know, one in a hundred sort of say, you know, what was that you were doing? You know, there's no evidence behind that, et cetera. You know, your mind tends to focus on that one person. Although I have learned over the last few years to get a lot better at that, but generally the response has been very, very good. Um, and the first series to actually, to demonstrate on a prime time show that type two diabetes was a reversible condition, uh, you know, and something that can be done in some cases, although I'm not saying it has to be, within 30 days is really quite remarkable. I think that was very much ahead of its time because now, you know, now NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence in the UK have are now accepting that we can, you know, we can code in people's notes that type 2 diabetes can be put into remission. But that was very, very controversial for years here. And, um, you know, when my show came out, the first, in fact, the, it was the third episode in the first series where I, I helped a lady reverse her type 2 diabetes in 30 days. You know, the BDA, the British Dietitians Association, uh, released a statement about, you know, uh, criticizing the care that was given and you know, a very alarmist statement advising people not to adopt the strategies they saw and go and discuss with their doctor. That was a hugely, you know, that, that was quite a challenging time for me because, you know, I don't really, I don't do this to fight with people. You know, I'm not interested in having a fight with other people. I just want, you know, I think I found a better way than I used to, to look after people. I managed to show that on television and I just want to get that message out to as many people as possible. If people don't agree with me, fine, but I don't, I don't necessarily want to find this. So I found that quite hard actually. And I, the thing I found the hardest was what I would have preferred the BDA to say was, look, that isn't the approach that we take. We recognize the fantastic results you've got can we get together and discuss there's something interesting there? You know, I don't really understand why that approach wasn't taken because, you know, I, I wasn't sort of being down on dietitians or I wasn't criticizing other people's approaches or anything like that. I was simply going, okay, you've got this problem. I'm going to give you the best advice I can with all the experience and all the knowledge I have. And worst case scenario is you'll know better after four weeks, right? Best case scenario you know, I, I revolutionized your health. So that was the only really negativity I got on the first series was the, was the dietitians. But, you know, from, from so many medical doctors around the country, from nurses, from pharmacists, from nutritional therapists, from other dietitians, I got so much warm feedback saying, look, just incredible to see those results. We'd love to learn more. I got so many emails from medical students, Chris, and this made me incredibly excited. A lot of medical students contacted me saying, Look, Dr. Chastity, you know, we love, I love what I saw there, but I'm, not, I'm, I'm in the final year now at medical school. I'm not learning about this. You know, how can, I, how can I learn more? Because that was incredible. So I think it's been highly significant here. It's really, it's changing the conversation here. I think a lot of people now are, you know, are embracing lifestyle, uh, not only as a way of preventing getting ill, but also as a therapeutic tool to treat people when they are ill. Um, I, I recently lectured for the Royal College GPs at a wellbeing conference as to how can doctors look after their health. And, you know, this, this GP came up to me afterwards and, and it really touched me. He said, look, I, I've just got to thank you. I said, what's happened? He said, look, the, the, the work that you've done has actually, you know, it's, it's set the stage for me to be able to do what I do. People give me a lot more credibility. I can now talk about these concepts that, in a way that I couldn't do four years ago because of the work you're doing, I just want to thank you. And it was great for me to hear that because yes, I'm doing it to help the public. I want to empower the public or as many people as possible to understand that actually 
no matter what your health problem is, right, some simple changes to your lifestyle can have a profound impact. But it's also nice, you know, when, when other healthcare professionals or when other medical doctors say, look, I love that, you know, I'm now using this approach with my patients and I'm getting great results. Thank you. And I think that one of the culminations of that for me, Chris, was in January of this year where I sort of created with a colleague the, the first what's called prescribing lifestyle medicine course that, that the Royal College of GPs have accredited. So that's our main institution here, have accredited that course with seven CPD points. And, you know, we had nearly 200 doctors come in January. And, you know, we had GPs, we had gastroenterologists, rheumatologists, oncologists, all coming learning from me and a colleague in terms of how you can apply these principles. And it was just incredible. You know, the feedback is 95% of them have said they would highly recommend this course to their colleagues. 85% of them have already said this has significantly impacted the way that they are practicing medicine. And, you know, we didn't go the whole hog. We didn't go in as much detail as you offer, Chris, with the Crestman Institute. This was simply, this is trying to shift people from one to two rather than one to 10, right? right? And because I feel very passionate that, you know, your training exists, there is very good training out there for that really detailed, in-depth look at reversing chronic disease. But I thought, okay, look, the public have bought into this. A lot of the profession have seen those results, right? But probably don't have the time, energy, or inclination to go on and do this in-depth dive into functional medicine. Okay, what are the core principles and what can I actually teach them in one day to shift them from one to two or one to three? And, you know, the feedback's been incredible. So, you know, Chris, what has been the impacts? Well, I can tell you four or five years ago, we weren't having Royal College of General Practitioner accredited courses in lifestyle medicine. In 2018, we now are. That gives me a lot of hope. Absolutely. And that's exactly the change we need to see. And, and I mean, I think we all know when, when we're shifting a paradigm, we expect resistance. That's, you know, by, almost by definition, if we don't get resistance, we're not doing our job. You know, we're not, we're not really changing the conversation. And of course, we've seen similar things here. We're, we're seeing a lot right now about how, you know, the dietetics organizations are fighting health coaches because they want to be the sole providers of nutritional information. And they're arguing that nobody other than a registered dietitian should be able to offer nutrition advice, which, which I personally think is just crazy. But these are just the, you know, unfortunately, this, this stuff, it's not just about logic and, you know, what's the best direction, you know, from an evidence-based perspective. There's, we have to deal with all the, the messy human stuff that comes along with it. And that's fine. You know, we'll, we'll get there one way or the other. We, we will get there, Chris. And look, the, you know, I, you, you mentioned this about dietetics in, in the U.S. And it was literally last week where a big story came out on BBC, on the BBC website about a new radio documentary that they did, which I was featured in, talking about how doctors don't learn about nutrition at medical school or, or very much in this country. And, um, you know, my quotes were, heavily featured in that BBC article. And I, I know I read it. I, I didn't know it was out, actually. A friend texted me and said, hey, look, this is out. And I thought, oh, wow, this is <laughs> it's going to pick up a lot of a lot of noise. And I, I got quite a, you know, there was, there was quite a lot of, what do I call it, abuse? No, I wouldn't quite call it abuse, but there was a lot of interaction on Twitter from dietitians. That, you know, I said, look, we're not getting enough. One of the, one of the ways I have tried to make a change here is with this prescribing lifestyle medicine course, which is this one day masterclass to teach other healthcare professionals and particular medical doctors, you know, how they can start to apply these principles in their current system. And they said, well, why is no dietitian teaching that? And I very respectfully interacted back. I said, look, guys, look, I absolutely respect your expertise. You know, we're teaching a system, a framework, a new set of principles for people to apply. You know, everything that we taught was well within our expertise level to teach. And no one was responding to that. They just kept saying, dietitians are the only people who can give medical advice, you know, nutritional advice on medical problems. You know, this this is not a serious course because there's no dietitian there. And, And I thought, well, this is... You know, when you take a step back and you take the emotion out of that, I find it remarkable. You know, uh, what I would expect and prefer is, hey, look, that is great. You're trying to make a difference here. 
I tell you what, I've got some interesting things that I can add to that. Can we get together? Can I actually suggest what I might be able to add to that course? I would be very open to that. What I don't, you know, I don't really understand the assumption that our course is no good when you haven't attended it, whereas everyone who attended thought it was superb. And I thought that really just shows what we're fighting out there, which is a lot of ego, frankly, which, you know, there's really no place to that in healthcare because, you know, ego is getting in the way of getting people better. And this is not just about one organization fighting with another. We've got a serious problem, Chris. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got any disease you want. I mean, type 2 diabetes is is one that often gets spoken about. In 2012, right, so that's six years ago, we think that the uh, type 2 diabetes was costing the UK in direct and indirect costs 20 billion pounds a year, right? So what's that? (laughs) About, what, $26 billion? Incomprehensible. An obscene amount for a condition that by and large is an environmental illness. This is driven by our lifestyle and our environment. In yeah. That number is two, 250 billion in the US, by the way. <laughs> this is the population yeah. differential. Yeah. And, and instead of fighting, right, in terms of who, who has got the, the authority to give the right advice, let's just be more collaborative. Go, hey, look, that's great. That's working. Well, this is working. You know, what can we do together? Because Patients get incredibly frustrated. The public gets incredibly frustrated because then they don't know who to trust. And I think like you, Chris, I've just decided to just focus on doing what I do. You know, I'm not, I normally stay out of those fights on Twitter. And the reason I, I got involved last, last week was because I was really trying to hold my, you know, extend the hand of collaboration. I go, look, this is great. Let's get together. Let's talk. Let's, you know, meet for the, for the greater goods. And, you know, I've learned that, you know, there's, you know, Twitter's not the best environment to actually try and change people's opinion. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. You know, I think things are changing. That's for sure, Chris. There's, there's no question here that things are changing. And I can't comment on how impactful my show has been, but I, I get told by a lot of people that the show has been game changing here. Yeah. I mean, I, I've definitely heard from lots of people. And when I was over there in the UK, I heard from lots of people who were turned on to these concepts from watching your show, both professionals and consumers. So I, I think it has had a big impact. And Chris, I would say for people who do, you know, if we, if we do provide the links to the shows and, and they watch them, just to say, look, this was edited for a mainstream audience. Right. And so I think some people, some viewers who may watch it might go, well, what happened there? Or, you know, what what testing was done. You've got, to re- you've got to remember that actually this was a 9 p.m. primetime slot. So, yeah. you know, a lot of the things I did got very simplified. The narrative got quite simplified. It was definitely a true narrative. It was definitely not inaccurate, but, you know, I would have preferred a lot more detail. Mm-hmm. But, but Chris, I've also learned being in the media that there's two sides to this. You know, the show that I would want to make uh, with all the detail in there, with all the science right? You'd probably have a hundred people watch that show. <laughs> Whereas, you know, the, the TV studios know how to edit a show in a way that actually engages a viewer. And so we had 5 million watching it. So initially I was frustrated that not all of my ideas and principles came across. But then I think, well, you know what, if 70% of your ideas come across to that many people, that's better than a hundred percent to 50 people. That's right. What. Absolutely. And that's how, I mean, TV is that kind of medium. You know, we're not talking about a book here. We're talking about a primetime TV show. So you have to customize accordingly. And I think you did a great job of that from the episodes that I've seen. Yeah, thank you. Um, speaking of books, let's talk a little bit about your new book, How to Make Disease Disappear. It's actually available in the U.S. now. It was published in the U.K. as the Four Pillar Plan, I, I believe, right? Yeah, absolutely. And um, at the beginning of the show, I mentioned that you and I not only share a passion for reinventing healthcare, we also share a similar perspective on, you know, the most important way to do that. And in your book, you you talk about these four pillars, and they're actually identical to the the four pillars that I mentioned in my fourteen four online program. So, tell us what they are and why you think they're so important for, you know, turning our health around. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I think I'll, I'll come into that. I'm just going to sort of just back up a, a little bit just to say that on the two series of Doctor in the House that I've done so far, I treated a wide variety of different conditions, whether it was type 2 diabetes, whether it was 
panic attacks and anxiety, whether it was insomnia, whether it was fibromyalgia, uh, chronic back pain, you know, visceral bowel syndrome, uh, cluster headaches, uh, all kinds of different things. And as I reflected, I thought 80% of what I have done with every single family, no matter what their label is, you know, no matter what we call that disease, 80% of it in its core was the same. And you know, I've been on an evolution over the past years, uh, as I'm sure you have, Chris, as, as you've got more and more into this area, that, you know, I love doing all the fancy testing and I love, you know, finding that little pathway that's not working and giving us supplements as much as anyone. But, you know, we often forget the low-hanging fruits and that is in those four key areas of health, which I call uh, relaxation, food, movement, and sleep. When we make small changes in each of those four areas, you know, it completely changes our biology in such a powerful way that many people don't realize. You know, we're always jumping for what's the, you know, what's that supplement we need? You know, what is that test that I need? And more and more, Chris, I'm realizing that actually, you know, these, these four areas for me are the core pillars of health. And we would get so far of the way there with many of us if we just start applying these principles. And so, you know, food and movement, of course, everyone has been talking about for years. But I think relaxation, which is the whole stress piece, and sleep is very much undervalued. And, the, you know, this book came out in January in the UK and it's doing incredibly well. And I think the reason it is, Chris, is because I've taken the pressure off people. I have said that, you know what, there's, there's four pillars, there's four core areas to this book. You know, 25% of the book is literally on each of those pillars, mm -hmm. right? And in each pillar, there are five chapters, and each chapter is a suggestion. Now, it's not a prescription, it's a su suggestion. So that means there's 20 possible suggestions that you can do from the entire book. Now, I don't think anyone's going to manage 20 in the modern world. I think it's going to be incredibly challenging. But I say, you don't have to do 20. Most of my patients tend to need to do about three in each you know, but I don't know for that individual in the context of their life and the context of their job, how many they will need to do. Some might get away with less. But the whole point of this book is about saying, look, you don't need to be perfect in one area. You don't need the perfect diet, right? If your diet is good enough, you're going to get more benefit from shifting over to another pillar and going to bed one hour earlier or actually switching off for 20 minutes each day and doing a bit of meditation. I've got many patients, Chris, who come to see me who actually they have read a lot of blogs and their diet is pretty good by the time they come to see me. Yeah. And you know, I had this, I'd say I had this type 2 diabetic patient recently. His diet was frankly outstanding. Um, you know, in fact, I, I would argue he was almost too aggressive with his carbohydrate intake. Mm. And he was stressing himself out because he could not get his blood sugars under control. And I remember seeing him and I said to him, you know, I don't think your diet's the issue here. I think the fact that you're chronically underslept and that you're a busy executive and you never have any downtime, I think these are the, the, the levers we need to turn to get your blood sugars under control. Mm -hmm. And he was shocked because he thought it was all about carbs. You know, that's yeah. all he read on the internet. That's all, you know, he says, no, no, I must be getting carbs from somewhere out, you know, that I'm not realizing. I said, look, honestly, and I drew him this diagram and I, and I talk about this in, in the How to Make Diseases Appear book. I, I sort of go this one and say, well, look, if... Diet is not driving your type of diabetes. You know, if, you, if there's four possible things that could be playing a role here and you have maxed out on your diet, you know, what, if these other factors are driving your blood sugar now and you don't tackle them, it doesn't matter what you do with your diet. And, you know, I, I won't go into the whole detail of the story, Chris, but essentially no. I got him to eat more carbs, right? Mm -hmm. But he started to prioritize relaxation. And, you know, I just traded with him. I, I made a deal with him. I said, just five minutes a day. Mm -hmm. you know, because he said, I can't do it. I said, okay, what can you commit to? And he came up with five minutes a day. We, uh, we downloaded the Calm app, uh, the meditation app in my clinic. Yeah. Right there. And so he did that. He went for a 15 minute walk every day and he, he had a relaxing practice before he went to bed. I'm not kidding you, Chris, but he came back maybe six or eight weeks later, he was eating more carbs and his blood sugar had come down back into the normal range. And it's, I think even in the health sphere, we, you know, a lot of us talk a lot about diet and diet clearly is very important. I, you know, I'm a huge advocate for changing one's diet, 
but it's not everything. And, you know, it hits, I think we can over obsess and we can hit a certain ceiling and, and forget there's other big levers that we could be turning. Um, so that's really where my approach comes from. You know, the, the approach really comes from what I've learned from my patients, both on the TV series, but also in 17 years of practice, which is, you know, anyone could go on a, on a seven day or a 10 day diet and lose weight and then, you know, or, or feel better. The question is, can they still be following that in two months and six months and in 12 months? Yeah. And I think the approach that I sort of lay out in my book is, is very simple. I think it's achievable for pretty much everyone. And I think it takes the pressure off people because I say quite clearly, look, I don't expect you to get all of these things. And actually, if you read one of these chapters and you don't like the suggestion I make, don't do it. Right? Yeah. You yeah. do like Choose one that does fit with your belief system and your lifestyle, because there is a lot of crossover there. And I think, certainly for me, I think that's where the magic is here, which is that if you do about two in each, two sustainable ones in each, I think you're going to get really profound results. And, you know, Chris, I, I you know, sometimes I don't know how you feel. Sometimes I feel very burnt out. We're trying to go around the country and spread this message as far and wide as possible. And I, a few weeks ago, I, I was very lucky. Jamie Oliver invited me to come and have lunch with him to talk about how can we really start to make a, an impact with the obesity epidemic in children. And it was a great meeting. It went on quite late. I, I, I'd been in London for two or three days, and I don't live in London. And I was on the train back home in the evening. I was exhausted. I, I got off at the station, and you know, my wife, I, I texted her, but she didn't reply. I thought she's asleep. The kids are asleep. So I, I, asked the I asked the cab to stop in, in a supermarket. And I thought, I'm just going to nip in, you know, very quickly buy some food. And I walked in, and three people suddenly stopped and turned around. And the lady said, oh, my God. I said, hey, what, you know, what's happened? She said, oh, my God, Dr. Shetty, we've just been talking about your book. I literally bought this book six weeks ago. I've been ill for, for 10 years. I had to give it work with fibromyalgia. Um, I've spent all my savings on private treatments. And all I've done is apply the principles in your book. I've never felt this good. I've been to the gym four times this week, mm -hmm. uh, sleeping eight hours a night. I've got more energy. And her husband came and gave me a big hug. And I thought, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing is because just for that one moment alone, it was, it was worth the months it took me to write the book. You know, and there's many more moments like that. But as you will have experienced, Chris, no doubt, many times in your career, the, the point is, is that she hasn't taken any supplements. Again, I, you know, I'm not saying supplements don't have a value. Of course they no. do. You know, and no. if she was my patient, I may well have actually given her some things to support her mitochondria, right? Sure. But even that taught me that, wow, just by applying the lifestyle principles, the low-hanging fruits, actually we can get a long way to where we need to. And that's really what I set out in mm -hmm. my book. I'm so chuffed. I'm so proud that it's, good, it's coming out in America because, you know, your country's uh, health outcomes, I think, are... Are worse than ours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we hold that distinction. We're we're ahead of the pack uh, as far as that goes. Ranked last in many measures of healthcare safety and efficacy. It's so that's a, one example. But there's a story I put right at the start of the book, which is this is actually before I knew the in-depth functional medicine knowledge that I know now, Chris. And I, I remember it was early on in my days as a GP. Right, I was in a busy Monday afternoon surgery. I had three people waiting outside. I was trying to, you know, trying to, this was years ago. I was trying to sort of catch up. And the 16 year old boy comes in with his mother. And ultimately, basically there's a letter there. He basically tried to harm himself on the Saturday. He ended up in the ER. Hmm. Now, he was, he ultimately was, he, he was discharged from the ER. Uh, they thought he was safe to be discharged, but there was a letter for him to come and see me on the Monday and for me to start him on uh, antidepressants. Now, I didn't know as much as I know today, but something intuitively did not feel right to me. I thought, look, I don't know what's going on here. This family seems to be reasonably well balanced. You know, I can't quite figure out what's been going on here. So I spent a little bit of time talking and I said, guys, look, can you guys come back tomorrow at the end of my morning surgery and I'll spend a bit longer with you? I said, yeah, okay, fine. I of course made sure he was safe to, to send home that night and there was no sort of immediate issue comes back the next day and at the end of it i at the end of our sort of 20 25 minutes of chatting i start to feel could there be a you know could there be an issue with his use of social media mm -hmm. because i 
was really worried how much he used it and how, what his feelings were like after he was using it. So I said to him, look, I'm not sure that the way you're using social media is helping you. Would you be interested in me helping you to reduce that? And he said, well, do you think that's going to help, Doc? I said, well, look, I don't, honestly, I don't know. But, you know, before we put you on these antidepressants, if you're interested, let me help you do this. So what we did, we said, you know, can you one hour before bed switch off your smartphone? And he goes, do you think it's going to help? I said, look, let, why don't we try it? You can stay in touch with me. So anyway, he goes away and he does that for a week. Seven days later, he comes back in. And just to be clear, this is within the realms of conventional 10-minute appointments, okay? He comes out to see me. And I said, how are you feeling? He said, well, you know, I still don't feel great, but, you know, I'm sleeping better. I'm less up and down throughout the day. You know, something has changed. Now, Chris, don't get me wrong. The guy's still not doing very well at all. Yeah. But not to make a small improvement. But now I've got buy-in that there's something here that he might be able to impact. So we move it. Over the course of the next few weeks, we move it to two hours in the morning where he doesn't go on his uh, devices or his phone and two hours in the evening. And he's getting better and better. He's still not great, but he's improving each time. And then I was reading some research about how our diets can influence our mental health. And so I asked him, what are you eating? And it was a classic teenager's diet, so sugary, processed junk food, you know, blood sugar, roller coaster all day. And I, I explained to him, I drew him out this little picture and I said, hey, but do you realize that actually, you know, maybe two hours after your breakfast when your blood sugar is rapid, you know, is falling rapidly, that is a stress response to your body. And it's not just a blood sugar issue. It's not just, that, you know, you know, you need to eat a bit more for concentration. That is impacting your cortisol levels, your adrenaline levels, and all your mood hormones. He said, well, really? I said, yeah, the foods you're eating, I think, are also impacting this. And so I drew him a picture and I said, look, a few more healthy fats throughout the day. And I, you know, I won't go, you know, in the interest of time, I won't give the whole case, Chris, but essentially I helped him make some simple changes to his diet, not full on perfection, right? Just simple changes. Yeah. And he's starting to improve and I don't see him for six months. And um, I, I go into my surgery and I, I've got a letter waiting for me. And it's basically his mother. I said, dear Dr. Chatty, I just want to thank you. You've completely changed Devin's life. He's like a different boy. He's happy at school. He's interacting with his friends. He, you know, he joins clubs at the weekends. I just want to thank you. And that really, that case has taught me so much that just simple lifestyle changes, when explained clearly, when explained in a way that actually resonates with the person in front of you, can have a profound impact. I am not claiming this happens in every case, Chris, right? Absolutely not. But that taught me a lot how, you know, those are simple things. And a lot of people say, you know, a 16 year old will never listen to you. Well, I disagree, you know, if you mm -hmm. connect with that person. And, and actually, the thing we've not spoken about, Chris, and something I'm very passionate about is that actually, I think the biggest skill for a healthcare professional is actually not our scientific knowledge, but can we connect and communicate with the person in front of us? Because I find every patient wants to be as healthy as they can. They don't want to be struggling. They don't want to be on your waiting list or on my waiting list. Actually, they want to be living their life. But and I think we assume, uh, certainly my profession in the UK, we assume a lot the patients don't do what we tell them to do. And I don't really buy into that. I just think if we can connect with them and we can make it achievable for them, they do want to make those changes. And that's essentially what I do in my book, Chris. I make these changes seem achievable for everybody. And I think that's why so many people are resonating with the message. And they are. And that's, I mean, I'm in exactly the same place as you, Rangan, because after, you know, many years of doing very, you know, sometimes going down the functional medicine rabbit hole, which, as yeah. you know, can take you pretty deep. I'm more convinced than ever, as you are, that in many cases, the basics are what matter most. And I would also say, and this is very consistent with your book, that we often make the mistake of assuming that big problems require big interventions to, to make a difference. And what I've found is actually it's a series of small changes that tends to make the biggest impact instead of these hugely dramatic interventions. And I think that's really the message of your book as well. Yeah. And I think, Chris, we've all got, you know, one thing I've recognized, we've all got our own personal bias. You know, I certainly, because when I changed my diet, that had such a profound impact on the way I feel. 
that I then for a few years was assuming that that is, you know, it all starts with food. You know, that's the key intervention. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not saying that isn't the case, but I've learned. Uh, I see those four pillars as like almost they all feed into each other in a circle, right? You can get on wherever you want, but they'll all feed around. So if you want to start with food, that is fine, right? You know, I started with food, but I, I had a patient we see with a mental health problem who, you know, frankly was not interested in changing his diet, but I could persuade him to become more physically active. And as we ramped up his physical activity, he then wanted to start eating better, which then, you know, had an impact on his sleep, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I've kind of learned over, over the 17 years of seeing patients, just do not assume anything about your patients. They may not want to start where you want to start. And, you know, that really has helped me define that very simplistic. I think, I think the structure of my book, Chris, actually is deceptively simple because the chapter titles are actually quite a simple intervention. I, I, I sort of walk people through the science, but then bring it back and say, actually, you know, the lifestyle intervention at the end of all that science is actually relatively straightforward. <laughs> so I don't think we realize, you know, I've got this, this phrase that I use quite a lot now, which is consciously make changes to your lifestyle to unconsciously change your biology. And, you know, that in a nutshell is the approach that I take these days. Well, this has been fantastic. I'm so glad you could take time out of your busy schedule to join us. And as I mentioned, How to Make Disease Disappear is out today in the U.S. I definitely recommend checking it out. You know, as I said, I I believe that a series of these small changes, even for people who are, and this is a key point, who are really knowledgeable about this stuff. I mean, my patients are some of the most informed, knowledgeable patients that you're ever going to find. I mean, they're, they're people who've been reading these books and following the blog posts. And in, in many cases, they're healthcare professionals themselves. And yet, in my work with them, I often find that the biggest difference comes from making some of these changes, like, you know, implementing a digital detox or, you know, a tech Sabbath one day a week or starting a stress management practice or, incorporating more time for leisure and pleasure in their life. Like these things might seem insignificant, you know, compared to doing thousands of dollars of lab testing and treatment. But uh, frankly, in many cases, they end up making a bigger difference. And exactly. How how could that be more powerful, you know, than, than, you know, this is, this is fine. I know all that stuff, but you know, yeah, it's the real medicine. That's, that's the, that's the nub of the matter. Uh, absolutely. And I, I've been beating this drum for, for many months now. I, I think I've, it's just really become even more clear to me. And it's one of the reasons we're launching a health coach training program. Actually, by the time this is out, enrollment will already be open for it. Uh, because I so deeply believe that diet, lifestyle, and behavior change is is the key. And uh, the problem is that it sounds almost trite. You know, we've said that so many times. People are like, yeah, yeah, tell me something I don't already know. But we don't already know it. Because if we did, we'd be acting and behaving differently, even myself. I mean, this is something that I continually have to come back to. You know, for, for example, as aware as I am about the effects of technology, and I do a pretty good job of limiting my use. Over the last several months, I had started to slip. And so I just, you know, we drew a hard line in the sand and we've gone back to Sundays being absolutely, completely technology free. We just put our iPads and computers in a drawer. We don't interact with technology at all. And it's been absolutely transformative to go back to that. And now we're planning a vacation soon where we're gonna have another experience where we've done every year where we're completely off the grid, no technology for, for eight or nine days. And, and I can tell you that, that that has as big of an impact on my health as just about anything else. Chris, I, just, I mean, I shared with you just before we, we went live on air that in February of this year, you know, I, I had just been, you know, without confusing people, the, the, the book came out in the UK in January and it's obviously today it's out in the US, which is just fantastic. But I was burnt out from all the book promo, you know, speaking to hundreds of people every night all around the country. You know, the irony, you know, you've experienced this before, Chris, I never have. The irony of promoting a health book is what you do to your own health <laughs> yeah. uh, whilst you're doing that. And we, we booked a very last minute holiday to, uh, we went to a place called Dubai. 
Um, I was so burnt out and I just said, right, I'm just I'm, I'm having it. And I made a big deal of it on my Facebook and my Instagram. I said, guys, I'm, you will not be getting anything from any of my channels uh, mm -hmm. over the next nine or 10 days. And not only did I say that, I managed to do it. We got to the hotel and I put my laptop and my phone in the safe and they stayed yeah. there. And I tell you, that holiday was probably the best holiday I've ever had because I don't think we realize how much noise technology constantly, it just nags away at you and it just drains your mental energy day after day after day. Now, look, I love tech as much as the next guy. Like you, Chris, I go through an ebb and flow. Sometimes I slip into bad habits and we all need constant reminders. I mean, just because we're sort of preaching this stuff, it doesn't mean we are perfect by any stretch of the imagination. It's, yeah. it's a constant challenge. And I think you know, collaborating with health coaches is absolutely the way forwards. Uh, and I'm delighted to hear about that. But yeah, if you have not, you know, some people may say, I can't do a whole eight, nine days without tech. Okay, fine. Try it on a Sunday morning. Yeah. Try going to the park with your kids, right? And don't take your phone with you. It is a different experience. Mm. It, and you feel, I sometimes come back. I feel like I've had a holiday just when I'm not on my phone for four hours. It's just incredible. Absolutely. Yeah, we don't recognize how much it influences us until we get that break. And, and I definitely recommend starting small, like, like you said, Ryan, and not, don't start with nine days. That's probably going to be too difficult, but start with uh, half a day or even an hour and see, how, see what kind of impact it makes. And that, Chris, that's the approach I've, I've always taken with myself and with, well, not always with myself, actually. I've sort of pretty strict with myself and I've uh, got myself into a bit of trouble sometimes trying to really stick to some really you know, hardcore health regimes, but I've learned what is sustainable is these, you know, these small changes that are achievable. Because if, you know, if it's, say for example, one of the things I recommend, you know, I talk a lot about strength training as you do, Chris, it's very much undervalued. When we talk about movement and exercise, you know, people often undervalue how important lean muscle mass is. And, you know, a few years ago, I was telling my patients this, I was saying, hey guys, you know, you know, once you go past 30, you know, you can lose up to 5% of your muscle mass every 10 years. You know, your muscle mass is one of the biggest indicators of your health as you get older. And, you know, I say, you know, you've got to join the gym and do this. And, you know, a few weeks later, they come back and I say, how are you getting on? I say, oh, you know, doc, I can't manage it. You know, it's too far. And I've always thought, okay, right, I'm giving advice that they are not able to follow. I never felt that actually you know what, these guys are not doing what I'm telling them to do. I thought, okay, clearly the advice I'm giving them doesn't resonate with them in the context of their life. So I came up with a thing that I, I talk about in my book and I actually did on one of the shows in Doctor in the House called a five-minute kitchen workout, which is basically a very simple body weight workout that anybody can do of any age. You know, I've literally got patients in their 20s doing it, patients in their 70s doing it. You don't need any equipment and you can get a really good strength workout doing, you know, you don't need to join a gym, you don't need to get changed. And I've always looked for how can I make these things practical for people? And what I found is by, when they say they don't have time and I say, well, can you give me five minutes twice a week? But like, yeah, yeah, no problem. Of course I can. You start off slow and they do this five minutes twice a week. They start to feel the benefits. And before you know it, they're doing it six times a week. Yeah. And you know, I, had, I say that I talk about this couple in, my, in the book, uh, this couple in their 60s, who I spoke, to, I, I taught them this five minute kitchen workout in my clinic room. Right? <laughs> I think they thought I was mad. And they were, they were a little bit skeptical. And they said, okay, Doc, we'll give you a go here. And they started it off and they enjoyed it so much. And when they came back to me, see me four weeks later, they said, look, when we run our evening bath upstairs on the landing, we both do it for about seven minutes now, <laughs> five nights a week. That's great. So, yeah, it's incredible. Because so I thought, wow, you can really make a difference. When, when you set the bar low, people achieve it, then they want to do more. You set the bar too high, people don't achieve it, they just give up. And that's really, and this approach, I think, is quite different from what I was doing five, six years ago. And, and like you, Chris, I, I listen to my patients, I learn from my patients, and this is the approach that I think works for the vast majority of people. And, and this is, that's fundamentally a coaching approach. I mean, there's yeah. a concept in coaching called shrink the change, which means if you take a big change that you want to make, you have to break it into smaller, more actionable steps, which is exactly what you did there. And these, I mean, this is why I'm so excited about the coach program because we assume that, that people, when they don't change, it's because of, they don't have enough information 
you know, and we just need to give them more information and then they'll change. But, but really, that's actually not the case. People don't change because they don't know how to change. And we as, as practitioners don't know how to support them in making that change. And so just learning uh, about how human beings actually do change and incorporating some of that into our work can make a huge difference. Yeah, absolutely. Chris, before, before we finish, I just want to say how much I respect the work that you have done over the past few years. You know, I think very few people have done as much as you to raise awareness of you know, ancestral uh, approaches, functional medicine approaches, lifestyle medicine approaches. And yeah, I just want to give a lot of gratitude to you. I think your blog is fantastic and um, very much in awe of the work that you've done. Oh, well, thank you, Rangan. I appreciate that. So everybody, uh, How to Make Disease Disappear, it's available today on Amazon and elsewhere. And uh, do check out, we'll put a link in the show notes to your YouTube channel, Rangan, where people can um, watch some of the episodes of the show. I think that would be a great thing for for everybody to see. And look forward to seeing you again next time that our paths cross, Rangan. And uh, good luck with the book and, and everything else. That's great. I'll see you soon. All right. Hey, everybody. Chris Kresser here. I hope this podcast and my blog and books have been helpful resources for you and will continue to be. But if you've been struggling with a chronic health problem and are feeling stuck, consider coming to work with my team and me at the California Center for Functional Medicine. We work with patients all over the U.S. and have experience treating a wide range of conditions, including GI problems, autoimmunity, hypothyroidism, cognitive mood and behavioral issues, weight gain and metabolic dysfunction, and more. Our unique model teams, clinicians with nurse practitioners and health coaches, all of whom are trained in my ADAPT framework approach to provide a high level of care to our patients. This means more support between appointments, personalized guidance on diet, lifestyle, and behavior change, a cutting edge patient portal with 24 seven access to your labs and records, handouts and resources to guide your protocols, and a team of practitioners working together on your case. We're currently accepting new patients, so if you'd like to learn more, visit chriscresser.com slash become a patient. That's the end of this episode of Revolution Health Radio. If you appreciate the show and want to help me create a healthier and happier world, please head over to iTunes and leave us a review. They really do make a difference. If you'd like to ask a question for me to answer on a future episode, you can do that at chriscresser.com slash podcast question. You can also leave a suggestion for someone you'd like me to interview there. If you're on social media, you can follow me at twitter.com slash chriscresser or facebook.com slash chriscresserlac. I post a lot of articles and research that I do throughout the week there that never makes it to the blog or podcast, so it's a great way to stay abreast of the latest developments. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you next time.